Welcome everyone to today's webinar. Thank you for attending. My name is Sandra Finity. Today's webinar is on amendments to the Retail Shop Act and will be presented by Peter B. Kink and Katie Lockridge. Before we meet our speakers, I would like to give you a brief overview of today's webinar. If you have any difficulties viewing the presentation, please call Sophie Parker on 0419-946-570. I repeat, 0419-946-570. After the webinar, we will send an email to all attendees with a link to the recording and a copy of the presentation. We invite you to ask questions at any time during the presentation. Please use the chat box on your screen to enter your questions. We will respond to as many questions as possible. We also request that even if you are listening via phone or mobile, that you please submit all questions via the chat box. If you are a legal practitioner and would like to receive CPD points for this webinar, it is important that you remain in attendance for the duration of the webinar. I'd now like to introduce our speakers. Peter Beeking is lead partner of Lavin Legal Property Services Group. Peter practices in all aspects of commercial property and has significant experience in land development, leasing, the acquisition and disposal of assets and the financing of commercial projects. Peter has over 30 years experience in commercial property and has worked in land and property development since 1987. Peter is also a member of the Law Council of Australia, the Business Law Section, the Australian Institute of Company Directors, and the Property Council of Australia, also known as PCA. He sits on the PCA's WA Commercial Property and Retail Management Committee. Katie Lockridge is an associate in the leasing team within the Property Services Group. Katie practices primarily in the area of leasing and is experienced in the drafting and negotiation of leases on behalf of landlord and tenant clients for retail office and industrial premises. In addition to her leasing experience, Katie has advised on the sale and purchase of office building and retail shopping centre premises, including any associated due diligence. Katie also has experience in a range of other property related manners including drafting and negotiating easements, property acquisitions and disposals, and associated duties advice. Thank you for joining us today, Peter and Katie. I'll now hand you over to Peter. Thank you, Sandra. Um, welcome, everybody, to this webinar. This is a whole new experience for me. Um, and after Sandra's introduction, I feel a little bit like I'm sitting in a BBC studio. Um, the closest I'll ever get to that august institution. Um, can I start off by just sort of painting the scene about why I think leasing is, is such an important part of um, commercial transactions in this state? Um, a lot of people, I think, don't uh, give proper credence to the importance of, of leasing to commerce in this state. If we talk about uh, builders of buildings, builders of shopping centres, the leasing of those assets are what generate the return that create the capital value for the developer they create the attraction for investors to invest. They provide uh, opportunities for people to carry on business, such as retailers or people that use office space in commercial buildings. From a financier's perspective, they are the bases by which uh, the debt is repaid for the construction of these, these structures, and it also generates profits for those organisations. So with just those two sort of small vignettes, it does tell you that leasing is an integral part of a lot of our commercial life in Western Australia. Um, and for that reason, I, uh, I uh, think that leasing is such an important part of our practice and I'm very pleased to be able to talk about this topic today. Katie Lockridge is my right and left hand person in our practice here and uh, most of the work that you see that goes down under my name is really uh, the work that Katie does and uh, without her I would be completely lost. So, Katie, thanks very much for being with us today. Thanks, Peter. Um, I had a look through the list of attendees today and I think I've worked um, closely with quite a lot of you, so please feel free to get in touch with me um, for any queries that you have after this presentation as well. Okay, shall we get down to 10 tax? Can I set the scene for this, uh, this piece of legislation? Um, the, the gestation for this amendment um, act 
actually began in 2003 when there was a review done uh, pursuant to the provisions of the original Act of this legislation. It went through the, the Gallup government and the Carpenter government and finished up in the hands of the Barnett government. Um, it got derailed a couple of times during the Carpenter government because these amendments were tied to the uh, amendments of the re uh, retail trading hours. And when they were derailed, so were these amendments. Um, at long last, uh, the legislation was passed uh, as at 1 July in 2012. However, there was a significant change in the approach to this legislation brought about by the amending legislation. And that change was to create significant flexibility in the ability to amend the legislation through regulation. And as a result, um, a lot of time was spent trying to get the regulations right. Um, and, and that time was such that uh, these, uh, the, the, the Act came into effect in large part on the 1st of January 2013. Uh, I think there was in fact a little bit of a rush to get these regulations through and despite some industry comments in relation to certain parts of the regulations, those, those comments were largely ignored largely because the government had made a commitment to have these, uh, this amending legislation in place before they went to the election. So what we're going to see is the ability in the future for this legislation to be able to be amended through regulation, which means it doesn't have to go through the parliamentary system. And uh, that's a significant change in this, uh, this legislation. Can I outline um, what the amendments have done? And then as we go forward, uh, we will analyse what we've been able to glean in the couple of months that this piece of legislation has been in force. In effect, there are nine areas of amendment and one consequential piece of, uh, amendment, a piece of legislation that complements these amendments. The nine areas of amendments relate to uh, the definitions where some definitions have been removed, there are some new definitions and some definitions have been changed. Obviously, the disclosure statement will change because of the amendments to the legislation. Uh, the rent review mechanisms change. This is in relation to uh, contested market reviews where a third party umpire is brought in to, to determine what is the market rent. There are changes in relation to operating expenses or outgoings. These fall into two categories. Basically, uh, outgoings that are reference, uh, referable to a group of, of retail outlets within a, a, a centre and also the expenses that a landlord can recover in respect of his lease. The five-year tenancy regime has been uh, altered to create a short-term lease of six months and we'll talk about that a little bit further in this presentation. The whole concept of options and notices to tenants about when these options need to be exercised uh, has been brought into the legislation. There is a, a new relocation clause which if adopted by uh, the, the landlord and the tenant in their lease in the form of that prescribed in the, in the regulations means that you don't, don't have to get SAT approval for that relocation clause. Uh, there, there, are, there is a change that, that uh, regulates what costs a landlord can recover from the tenant. Uh, there is the introduction of misleading and deceptive conduct provisions into this uh, Act and there's been a small tweaking to the unconscionable conduct provisions uh, that came into force uh, last uh, June. Complementing this, these amendments uh, is the, the provisions that now relate to the Small Business Commissioner because he now has an integral part to play in trying to resolve disputes concerning small business and retail uh, operations. So let us have a look at um, what's happened in the area of definitions. First of all, the old definition of retail floor area has been deleted. There's a new concept called relevant proportion and this is referable to outgoings or expenses and is tied in with the concept of group of premises. I'll talk about how these two concepts work a little bit further into the presentation. There's a, a concept of total lettable area, which is a revised definition, and I'll come to that shortly as well. Group of premises is a new concept, and the common thread with this group of premises is that they, um, they have a set of outgoings or an outgoing that is referable only to that group of premises. Um, 
this is a useful, I think, uh, a useful change to the legislation. I'll outline it a bit later, but it does allow outgoings to be more equitably uh, attributed to the relevant premises that use those outgoings. There's a new definition of lettable area, um, and this replaces the old concept of total lettable area. So whilst there's been a revision of the definition of total lettable area, the bits that have been revised have been incorporated into the lettable area definition. The misleading and deceptive conduct application, um, this has been uh, added into the legislation and the concept of um, unconscionable conduct now has been tweaked to refer to situations where a person can suffer or may be likely to suffer loss or damage. So this is, uh, you don't have to prove the damage now, you may, may be sufficient simply to prove the possibility that damage may be suffered because of unconscionable conduct. There's a new definition of retail business um, and the significant change here is that it allows by regulation the scope of retail business regulated by this legislation to be expanded. Um, there's a new concept of retail shop or, or an, uh, an amendment to the definition of retail shop which allows premises to be excluded by, by legislation. Um, you will recall in the previous definition it, it automatically excluded things like petrol stations in that long definition it used to have. Um, now it's, it's, it, it excludes reference to those sorts of things um, and uses the regulation to exclude what, what wouldn't ordinarily be a retail shop. The concept of retail shop lease has been narrow, narrowed. Um, you will recall that under the previous definition public companies whether listed or unlisted were automatically excluded from the scope of this legislation. That's been changed now so that it's actually listed entities and there are two classes of these. First of all there are public companies listed on the Australian Stock Exchange and subsidiaries of those companies. Secondly there are companies that are listed on stock exchanges outside of Australia where those stock exchanges are part of the World Federation of Exchanges. In addition the regulations allow uh, other companies to be excluded from the scope of this definition and when they brought in the concept of World Federation of Exchanges, um, a regulation had to be passed to allow public companies listed on the New Zealand Stock Exchange to be excluded because the New Zealand Stock Exchange isn't part of the World Federation of Exchanges. The concept of a thousand square metres being the uh, critical point at which um, a shop is either a retail shop or not. Uh, remains. However, uh, by regulation, shops that have more than a thousand square metres of, of total lettable area can be brought within the scope of this legislation. At this point in time, no regulations have been passed uh, to take advantage of that. The concept or the definition of retail shopping centre has been amended, and and the principal change here is to um, overcome the issue of multi-use buildings where you might have retail on the lower floors, uh, office or residential on upper floors for example. So the legislation now says that the retail shopping centre is only relevant to those floors where retail business is being carried on. Um, that's an improvement and a significant improvement because it takes away that argument that Allendale Square for example is, is a shopping centre as opposed to the lower levels where the retail is carried on. However, I think they could have been a bit more precise because if, uh, if, if there's retail on part of a floor, the whole of that floor is arguably retail, which I think um, is a bit of a nonsense and with a bit of careful drafting we could have overcome those, those sorts of problems. Let us move on now to the concept of lettable area. Uh, the lettable area is, the lettable area of a retail shop is so much of the surface area of the premises as are designed and available for use in carrying on the business that is or will be carried on at the shop. Um, I'm not quite sure why they use the term so much of the surface area of the premises in this definition um, because does the surface area include the floor, does it include the areas of the walls, does it include the surface of the ceiling. Um, it seems to me that all measurements of retail and commercial um, premises uh, by way of floor area um, but for whatever reason they've used this term. I understand that the concept here is supposedly similar to the Property Council of Australia um, method of measurement but there are some, some subtle differences. 
Certain areas are excluded from the calculation, um, and these include balconies, terraces, verandas, public spaces and thoroughfares. Essentially, those items where the tenant does not have exclusive use, and that does make some sense. Common facilities uh, or areas that are used for common facilities um, are excluded, and they would include things like access ways, cupboards, which are for use for people other than the tenant or in tenant and others, escalators, stairwells and landings, again, where they are used by the common users of, of the building or the development, fire hose, cupboards, lift shafts and lobbies, plants, motor rooms, recessed doorways and the like. Again, you'll see in that second list that's just been brought onto the screen, things like storage rooms, toilets, tea rooms, where they are common facilities for the centre or the building, they are excluded from the definition. That does make sense. So if we look at the amendments that have come into place for disclosure statements, prior to the um, amendments to the Act, the landlord was required to give a tenant a disclosure statement at least seven days before the lease was entered into. If that disclosure statement was false or misleading, the tenant had 60 days within which to terminate the lease. Under the amended provisions, if the disclosure statement is incomplete or contains false or misleading information, the tenant now has a six month period within which to terminate the lease. And the tenant may also apply to SAP for an order that the landlord pay compensation to the tenant for any loss the tenant suffered as a result of the omission of the landlord to give a disclosure statement, the landlord giving an incomplete disclosure statement, or the landlord giving the false or misleading information in that disclosure statement. And the Act has built in a couple of defences to the landlord, so the tenant will not be liable to terminate the lease if the disclosure statement is false, misleading or incomplete in circumstances in which the landlord has acted honestly and reasonably, the landlord ought reasonably to be excused for the failure, and where the tenant is in substantially as good a position as it would have been if the disclosure statement was acceptable. There's also been some changes to rent review, which Peter highlighted earlier. These changes are in section 11 of the Act. And the amendments clarify what factors should be taken into account during a market review, what information the landlord is required to provide to assist with rent review, and what happens if the landlord does not provide that information. There's a number of um, excluded factors now which cannot be taken into account during a market rent review. Those factors in include the business's goodwill in the shop, any stock, fittings or fixtures which are not the landlord's, and any structural improvements or alterations carried out or paid for by the tenant. Um, if the amount of rent payable is in dispute after a market review, then quite commonly a valuer will be appointed under the Land Valuers Licensing Act to act as an expert to determine the rent. The landlord is required to give the expert such relevant information as requested by the expert, and this is information about leases to similar shops in the same building or centre. The landlord is required to give that information to the expert within 14 days after the expert's request. And this information can include things such as current rents payable under other leases in the centre, any rent free periods or other forms of incentives which other tenants have, uh, any recent or proposed variations to other leases in the centre, the outgoings currently payable for each lease, and then there's a provision that they'll be have to provide any other information prescribed under section 113B of the Act. If the landlord uh, fails to provide that information within the 14 day response time and they don't have a reasonable excuse for, for that failure, the expert has to notify the tenant of the landlord's failure to respond within a further seven day period. So that's effectively 21 days after the notice requesting information was first sent. The tenant then has recourse to apply to SAT for an order to compel the landlord to comply with the expert's request for information. There's currently no consequences under the Act for the expert if they fail to notify the tenant that the landlord hasn't provided the requested information. Um, it may be contemplated that this will be dealt with contractually between the parties, or the tenant may have um, leave to apply to the tribunal on the basis that the expert's not performing its duties. The um, Act also builds in some confidentiality requirements in relation to the information that's provided by the landlord. As a general rule, the disclosure of the landlord's information for rent determination is prohibited. The Act provides a list of situations when disclosure is permitted, and most of these are straightforward and are things um, such as with both parties' consent, 
if required for legal proceedings, as required by law in general, or with lawful excuse. However, it's unclear exactly what excuses that includes. The information can also be disclosed to enable the rent to be determined or to specify the things which the expert had regard to when determining the rent. If that's provided, it's done in a way which does not identify the parties, the tenants or the premises. Uh, the information can be disclosed if it's already publicly available and any person who discloses the information and causes the landlord or the tenant to suffer loss or damage as a result will be liable to pay compensation to that party. And that compensation is reasonable compensation as agreed between the discloser, the landlord and the tenant or as determined by the tribunal. Okay, operating expenses. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there's concepts of um, a group of premises um, and that comes into this area of operating expenses. A group of premises is is a group of, of, of businesses within a shopping centre or a group of retail premises outside of a shopping centre which are, which incur or expend a particular class or type of outgoing and it's only relating to them. Now, for example, it could be in a, in a shopping centre you might have, say, the food court which might have higher electricity costs because they have more lights or whatever for that, for that reason. The, the fact that they are consuming more electricity because of that space, that extra electricity can be allocated to that group of premises and then is allocated, uh, the cost is allocated and recovered from the, uh, the, the premises that make up that group. How that is recovered is by reference to the concept of relevant proportion. The relevant proportion is the proportion that the lettable area of each premises bears to the total of the premises in that group. So if you have four premises of each of the same floor area, then it's 25% responsibility lies with each premise. The expenses that relate to those to that group of premises are called the referable expenses. So they're referable to that group of premises. So what this means is, is that it is possible for a tenant in a retail centre, for example, to actually be responsible for two classes of expenses. First of all, he or she would be responsible for their share of the outgoings that relate to the centre as a whole and for example that might be say 5%. However, in relation to the referral expenses to that group of premises, they may be responsible for 25% of those referral premises. So they will pay 5% of the outgoings for the whole of the centre plus their 25% share of those expenses that are referable to that group. Um, to, to me, I think that is a useful change and is a useful way of allocating expenses to the people that actually incur those expenses. Just to finish off on this top, topic of operating expenses, um, it's important to, notice, to note that uh, where the landlord is seeking to recover costs uh, in respect of its fittings and fixtures, this needs to be properly disclosed in the disclosure statement and if that's not done, then the, the costs relating to those fittings and fixtures cannot be recovered. And a good example of this would be what are the costs and contributions to the maintenance and running of the air conditioning system. So when we come to talk about the, um, the disclosure statement, the particularity of this information is quite important. Can I move now to uh, the minimum five year tenancy? Um, one of the most useful changes here has been this concept of a short lease. Um, and what this is, is, is it now permits leases to be granted for a period of a maximum of six months without creating the minimum five year tenancy uh, in relation to that premises. Um, so what that means is you can have a short term lease for not more than six months. The landlord has to give the usual disclosure statement in relation to that short term lease but the tenant does not have a statutory right to extend that lease out to a five year minimum term. Um, you cannot get around this issue by simply having rolling six month leases over the same premises because uh, the definitions run such that continuous occupation of the, of the space um, is, is the determinant. So if you've had a back to back six month tenancies in relation to the same space, you would then create a tenancy that would give rise to a statutory option to give the balance of a five year term. If there was a break between the uh, back to back leases then that would be different. However, 
to create that break, there would have to be an actual um, uh, removal by the tenant of its operation from those leased premises to show a complete break. If you simply said, look, the end date is uh, the 31st of January and the start date is the 15th of February, if they left all of their gear in there, I'm sure the courts would say, look, there was an implied license that they had use of those premises, at least for the storage of their, their uh, equipment, and more than likely would be held to be a continuous lease, which would then run foul of the minimum five-year term. Um, now, this has caused some consternation amongst some centre operators because under the old regime, um, advantage was taken of 90-day uh, license terms, principally in uh, shopping malls and things like that. Uh, that provision doesn't apply anymore. However, um, my view is, is that you have, if you have a lease or a license arrangement in a shopping mall, provided that lease or license does not prevent the mall or the thoroughfare from being used as such, such leases are not regulated by the Act and you can still, in effect, achieve the same result um, with a slightly different means. Um, the termination of, of the lease, uh, there's been some important little changes here. Previously, the, um, the general rule was that if, you wanted to, if the landlord wanted to terminate a lease early, um, he had to have, or the provisions he had to do that in the lease needed to be approved by the SAT. The exception to that was where there was a breach by the tenant. Um, now, quite often, tenancies have the support of guarantees, and under the old legislation, the fact that the, um, the guarantor may have become insolvent, uh, it was not an event of default that would allow the landlord to terminate the lease. The regulations and the amending act now say that where you've got a guarantee and the guarantors are either directors of the tenant or they are substantial shareholders in the tenant, if they become insolvent, that's a default event which will allow the landlord to terminate the tenancy. Mark Jones has sent in an email uh, and he asked, can the amendments to the operating expenses and referable expenses, can they be applied to leases entered into prior to 1 January 2013, i.e. existing retail leases? Um, I think the answer to that one is probably no because you need those provisions to be set out in your documentation. You could achieve this if you wanted to by a variation of the existing lease to bring those things in. But that would require the, uh, the uh, cooperation of both the landlord and the tenant. So um, if the, unless the tenant would see some advantage in this, I can't see that he would agree to such a change. So that's a change that uh, will only operate prospectively in new leases after the 1st of January this year. Before we leave the short-term lease thing, one of the anomalies that has come up in this legislation uh, concerns the statutory option to extend from, from a, uh, a lease. So if you've got a lease that say is for a year, there is the statutory option to extend that for another four years. Um, if the tenant was going to exercise that right under the old legislation, he had to give 90 days notice of that intention. The law has been changed now to say that that period has been reduced from 90 days to 30 days. Um, and that's a relatively short period of time for a, for a, a landlord to manage his centre. Where this is a little bit absurd is, is that we will talk sh shortly about the notice of the, land the landlord's obligation to give notice to the tenant of when he must exercise his option. Those notice periods also relate to the statutory options. So not only does the tenant now have the right to exercise his option as little as 30 days before the end of the initial term, the landlord has to give notice as to when, when that date is. It seems to me we didn't need to shorten the 90 day period because the landlord has an obligation to give the notice. So I think there's been a bit of a drafting glitch there. Uh, what the practical consequences for that are, I'm, I'm not sure. Okay, as I foreshadowed, um, there are obligations now on, on landlords to give notice, notices to tenants uh, of when they must exercise their option to renew the lease. The reason for this is, is that the courts have consistently uh, construed options in a very strict sense. So that if you wanted to exercise your option, you had to com comply strictly with the requirements of the lease. Leases had to provide, uh, or you had to give notice to the tenant, uh, to the landlord, between six and 12 months before the expiry of the term. 
if you didn't do that, if you purported to exercise um, outside that window, then the courts have consistently said that you've missed your opportunity to exercise that option. Now, obviously, um, the small business fraternity felt that they've been um, unjustly dealt with because of that type of regime. And there is now an obligation on landlords to give notice to tenants between six and 12 months prior to the option expiry date as to when they must exercise the option. So that is, the landlord's got to say to the tenant, listen, Mr. Tenant, um, you must exercise your option by no later than this date. And if, the, if, if, if that notice is not given, then the term of the lease is actually extended by the amount of that delay. Um, at any time um, after that notice is given, the tenant has an option whether to exercise that right or not. Um, if, uh, if the option is taken up though, the tenant does not pick up the extra term um, in the extended lease. The, 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 the extension term starts from the expiration of the original term of the lease. So it doesn't pick up the, uh, the default position because the tenant or the landlord was slow in giving the, the notice. The notice has to be in writing and this is one provision that will apply to all leases including those that were in place prior to 1 January 2013. The regulations provide some transitional relief and exemptions um, in relation to this notice uh, regime and they're set out on the screen before you. So if you have an option expiry date before the 1st of July 2013, the landlord doesn't have to give any notice so it's the old regime still applies. If you have an expiry uh, date that is between 1 July 2013 and 30 September 2013, then the landlord must give his notice to the tenant between 1 January 2013 and that date which is two months before the option expiry date. If the option expires between 1 October 2013 and 31 December 2013, the landlord must give his notice between 1 January 2013 and that date that is three months before the option expiry date. And leases uh, with an option expiry date after the 1st of January 2014, it goes to the regime which is the notice has to be given between six and 12 months before the option expiry date. And I think that those arrangements are entirely practical. Um, so if we now look at a new relocation provision, uh, so there's a new section 14A which has been introduced into the Act to deal with relocation. In effect now, a relocation clause will be void unless it is in the prescribed form, approved by the tribunal under section 14A3 of the Act, or the tenant has had five years in the premises and the clause is in accordance with the Act in those circumstances. So section 14A1A of the Act says that if you're going to use the prescribed clause, it must be in the prescribed form. Unfortunately, it doesn't say substantially in the prescribed form. So in our view, it's best to use a schedule in the lease document so you can drop the exact wording of that clause in. Um, it is still possible to get approval of alternative reloc relocation clauses by SAT. Uh, that's still permitted under section 14A3 of the Act, but this is only um, in circumstances where special circumstances exist by which approval ought to be given. And it's not clear to us whether the fact that a clause is used throughout a whole centre and has been previously approved will be considered special circumstances for approval. So if, uh, before we look at the new prescribed clause, uh, we'll look at the requirements um, of a clause in circumstances when the tenant has had five years in the premises. Um, the Act sets out these requirements in section 14A2. Um, if five years of the term have expired already, the landlord is required to give the tenant six months notice of the requirements to relocate and that notice must be written notice. The notice has to give details of the alternative shop and if the existing shop is in a retail shopping centre, the new shop must also be in that same retail shopping centre. The landlord has to offer the tenant a lease of the alternative shop on the same or better terms and conditions as the existing lease, except that the term of the lease must be no shorter than the remainder of the term of the existing lease. If there's rent payable, the rent payable under the new lease has to be no more than the rent payable under the existing retail shop, but there's a provision that um, that rent can be adjusted to take account of any difference in the commercial value between the previous premises and the new premises. The landlord is required to pay the tenant's reasonable costs of the relocation. Um, this includes, but not limited to, costs incurred by the tenant in dismantling fittings, equipment or services, 
costs incurred by the tenant in replacing, reinstalling or modifying finishes, fittings, equipment or services to the standard that existed in the tenant's previous retail shop, but only to the extent that they are reasonably required in the, in the alternative shop. Um, packaging and removal costs incurred by the tenant must be paid and any legal costs incurred by the tenant. So if we now look at the new prescribed clause, which is located in the regulations, it's in Schedule 1, Item 2, the landlord is still required to give the tenant six months written notice of the requirement to relocate. The relocation notice given by the landlord must contain details of the proposed redevelopment, the date on which the tenant's current lease will terminate, and notice to the tenant that it's entitled to claim compensation as a result of the relocation. At, at the time the landlord gives the relocation notice, it also must give the tenant an offer to lease in relation to alternative premises. The offer has to give details of the alternative shop, and if the tenant's current premises is in a retail shopping centre, the alternative premises must also be in that centre. The new shop has to be in a position of similar trading potential, have a similar floor configuration, have a similar lettable area, and meet all of the requirements of relevant legislation, so that things like current health, safety, building and fire legislation. So the landlord has to give the tenant an offer to lease, and that offer to lease has to contain details of the new premises, the date by which the tenant must accept the landlord's offer, and this date must be at least 60 days after the date of the offer. Tenant's acceptance of the offer has to be in writing. The rent payable to the new premises must be no more than is being paid by the tenant in the current premises. The terms and conditions of the lease of the new premises must be in the same or better conditions as the current lease, and the term of the substitute lease must be no shorter than the remainder of the tenant's term on its current lease. The landlord has to provide the estimated commencement date of the new lease, the estimated date on which the tenant can access the premises to fit it out, and a statement that the tenant should seek independent legal and financial advice in relation to the offer and the new premises. If the tenant accepts the landlord's offer, the new lease must be provided to the tenant within 21 days of acceptance of that offer, and the tenant then has a 60 day period within which to, to sign that lease. The terms of the new lease, uh, the commencement date can, can either be as agreed by the parties, or if a date can't be agreed, then it will be deemed to be 30 days after the retail shop is made available to the tenant for fit out. The rent reviews um, under the new lease must be in accordance with the reviews under the tenant's previous lease. The new lease also must have a termination right to the tenant, and this termination right comes into play if the landlord cannot provide the tenant with access to the new premises under the substitute lease, and that's due to the redevelopment or any other un unforeseen circumstance. And in those um, circumstances, the tenant can terminate at any time by giving the landlord written notice, and the landlord will have no claim against the tenant for compensation in those, in those circumstances. The landlord is responsible for arranging the preparation of the new lease, um, and also must pay for the costs of that new lease, must also pay the tenant's reasonable legal costs in relation to the termination of the lease, advice on the offer and the substitute lease, and also the tenant's reasonable relocation costs. And this will include costs incurred by the tenant in dismantling fittings, equipment or services, replacing, reinstalling or modifying fixtures and fittings. And the landlord is required to pay, to pay those costs as soon as reasonably practical after the removal of those fixtures and fittings from the retail shop by the tenant, but in any event no later than 30 days after the tenant has put in a claim for those costs. There's also a compensation provision. And the tenant is entitled to reasonable compensation for the termination of the lease, and that's determined as being reasonable compensation for loss and damage, and that includes loss of goodwill. The landlord is only liable to pay the written down value of tenant's fit out, and the Act states that that will be calculated by the current method used by the ATO for the depreciation of assets. So the tenant is required to give the landlord written notice of the loss or damage it intends to claim as soon as reasonably practical after it suffers and the landlord has a 30 day period within which to pay that. There's also a concept of abatement of rent which comes in now. Um, the Act provides for abatement of rent and any other occupancy costs for any period in which the tenant is unable to reasonably carry on its business in the new shop um, after the termination date of its previous lease. And this can be because the tenant needs to fit out the new shop, because there's a delay in access to the shop caused by the landlord, or any other actions of the landlord that cause a delay. 
the abatement will not apply to any um, period of time where the tenant is unreasonably delaying in fitting out the shop. And that, that applies unless that delay is outside the control of the tenant. So if we look at the differences between the prescribed clause and the clause that can be used if the tenant's had five years in the premises, um, the requirement to give six months notice is the same. Uh, the prescribed clause has more detail required in the relocation notice and that was things like details of the proposed redevelopment, dates of termination of the current lease and start date of the new lease. Under both leases, the, the, the terms must be on same or better terms, but the prescribed clause sets out in greater detail requirements as the floor area of the premises, the details of the new premises, the estimated commencement and fit out dates. The prescribed clause also sets out time periods um, within which the landlord and tenant have to give notices, accept offers, execute the lease documents and give the tenant that right of termination that we spoke about. The premises are not provided as a result of the relocation. Um, under the prescribed clause, the landlord has to organise a new lease and pay all the costs in relation to that lease. Both clauses um, have the requirement that the landlord pay relocation costs, but the prescribed clause differs in that it sets out the time period payment. So the major differences are really the compensation and abatement provisions. Um, the prescribed clause has the requirement for the landlord to compensate the tenant as we just discussed and also the rent abatement provisions that apply in relation to the fit out period for landlord interference. Okay, we've had uh, a couple of emails come in with some questions and we'll go through those now. Um, Richard asks, is the rent under the relocated lease the same dollar amount or per square metre? I think the short answer to that is it depends how the lease is the rent is described in the lease. If the lease says that the rent is X dollars per square metre, and in the case of these premises, the calculation is Y dollars, then um, I would have thought that the calculation for the rent under the relocated premises is also on a square metre basis. However, the requirement that the relocated or the alternate premises have a similar floor configuration and have a similar similar lettable area should mean that there's not going to be significant difference in the rent on a per square metre basis. If you say, if, if your lease in your original premises says it's X dollars and there's no reference to the um, calculation by reference to a rate per square metre, then I think that is the figure that you need to work on in your alternate premises. Um, the second part of the question is, would you have to do a fresh, fresh disclosure statement prior to completing the relocated lease? I think the answer to that would be yes. Um, because the premises have technically changed and it is a new lease, um, you, you'd have to comply with that that requirement now under the amendment. Yeah, I think the, the law is probably a little bit grey in that area, but you, you couldn't go wrong in giving that disclosure statement. And I would have thought the landlord should have all the information necessary to complete one of those things. So I think I would I would issue a disclosure statement on that. And you would need to make sure it's given to them before the lease is entered into in the required time. There's a question from Matthew that went back to um, what's a retail shop. And his question was, are service stations now considered a retail shop? shop under the Act as they were previously excluded. The answer to that question is there's not a specific exclusion for, um, for petrol stations or petrol operators. Um, it comes under that definition of what is a retail shop now. Most uh, petrol station operators, if they're operated by the oil companies, will be listed entities on a stock exchange either within Australia or on the World Federation of Exchanges. So those ones will be excluded uh, and will not be a retail lease. However, if there's an operator of a service station that is not a listed entity and the service station is not is, is less than a thousand square metres, then it may well be a retail shop for the purpose of this legislation now. I hope that answers those, those queries. Okay, um, we move on to the contentious issue of legal costs. A part to uh, a, a matter that's close to my heart in particular <laughs> and less so to others. Okay, um, what, what the law has done now is to say that um, the landlord cannot recover its legal costs for the preparation of the lease. So in effect now, the tenant pays his or her costs, the landlord pays his or her costs. Um, the landlord cannot recover any monies uh, or costs it incurs in obtaining mortgagee consent to a lease, nor can he require, uh, recover any costs uh, in, in complying with the Retail Shops Act. 
So let's look at a few examples of where this might come into play. If there's an extension of lease, uh, and that is uh, that is contained in the lease documents, in other words, there's a right to extend the term of the lease in the lease itself, then the exercise of that right and the documentation of that extension, the cost cannot be recovered by the landlord against the tenant. If there's an assignment of the lease, the landlord can recover those costs because there is no um, statutory right for the tenant to be able to assign the lease. Uh, the, the landlord is entitled to recover his costs for checking out the assignee to make sure that he has the necessary financial wherewithal and the experience to run the operation. If there's a default by the tenant under the, under the lease, then the costs that the landlord incurs in relation to that default can be recovered. In the case of a sublease, again, that is not a statutory right that the tenant has under a retail shop's lease and the landlord can recover the costs of, of the preparation of the sublease and all of the other costs that go with that. Similarly, if the tenant requests a variation of the lease, uh, those costs can be recovered by the landlord against the tenant. In terms of the costs of accounting uh, and outgoings, that's a requirement under the uh, legislation that the landlord do, does provide um, audits of certain accounts in, in, in relation to outgoings. However, Section 12.1b of the legislation does allow for those costs to be shared equally between the parties. So there's a, a, a statutory provision that deals with that. What happens if you have a combination of a document that is partly exempt from legal costs but partly isn't? So you have an extension and variation of lease. So there's, an, a, there's, a, there's a right to extend the lease that's contained in the lease, but there's a variation that's sought by the tenant. Um, on the face of it, uh, the extension uh, cost can't be recovered, but the variation cost can be. How do you determine what is the proportion if, if it's contained in the one document? Uh, not sure how you would do that. A simple answer to that might be to have two documents. Uh, which means that the lawyers might get paid twice, which is obviously music to lots of people's ears, um, but that's an issue. So if you want to uh, isolate the liability of costs, you may need to split things between two documents if you consider that the costs are such that they need to be protected in that way. If the costs are incidental or not that great, then, then you know, would it really be worth the effort? Um, can I just draw people's attention to a situation which we see quite often, which is where we're instructed to vary a lease by inserting a new option term into the lease. That is in fact the creation of a new lease. And usually when we're asked to do this, we create the new option so that that can then be immediately exercised and the tenant re remains in possession of the premises under the lease. That's actually a new lease and requires a disclosure statement to be given by the landlord to the tenant before or within the time frames required by the legislation. I think it's a point that's not um, appreciated by, by practitioners in the area. So you need to be a little bit careful if you think you can get around the legislation by saying, well, we'll just give you another extension term on your lease and we'll go from there. That you will need to give a disclosure statement and a, uh, a tenant guide as well in the extension documentation. Okay, which is a nice segue into the disclosure statement. Um, the disclosure statement has been significantly revised um, and, there are, and there is now new disclosure required for a number of things. First of all, options to renew need to be specified and how and when they should be exercised. Um, however, that, as I said earlier, that the landlord has additional duties to give further notice uh, during the course of the lease in relation to the exercise of those options. There is a requirement for clearer delineation of all of the costs payable under the lease, including marketing funds and sinking funds. So basically, it's a little bit like a prospectus list. The uh, information has to be clear as to uh, what costs are payable under the lease. Clearly, there's got to be a clear identification of the premises by attachment of a plan, and uh, some care needs to be given to make sure that the plan is, is a proper representation of the premises being leased. Um, there's an improved information requirement about permitted use and exclusive use of the premises um, and this, is, this can be an important thing in tenant mix in relation to shopping centres. Um, 
greater detail is required to be given in, in respect of services, fixtures and fittings that are provided with the premises. And this is particularly important if the landlord wants to recover costs with respect to those things. Now in this, in this regard, um, uh, greater detail is, is important. You, you want to err on the side of caution here rather than not. Uh, because your ability to recover in relation to these things um, may be prejudiced if there's not proper proper disclosure. Um, the disclosure statement does need to cover off on on termination rights. So there's there's um, the right to terminate. Um, is the, as, as we as we've said earlier, the right for a tenant to terminate for uh, incorrect information in the disclosure statement is extended from 60 days to six months. Uh, the tenant will not be able to terminate the lease because the landlord has provided a disclosure statement that is incomplete or contains false or misleading information. And as Katie outlined earlier, if the landlord has acted honestly and reasonably and reasonably to be excluded for the, excused for the failure, the tenant is substantially in as good a position as he would have been if the failure had not occurred. Um, and, and it, it is fair and just that, that that be the case. Now, those defences only arise if the disclosure statement is given. If the landlord does not give the disclosure statement, he doesn't get the benefit, obviously, of these defences, and the tenant can walk away from, from the lease. Um, the final piece of paper that needs to be given across is the tenant guide. And this has been revised to take into account all of the changes we discussed and it's been updated and modernised to some extent. Can I, before we move on to uh, the final concepts that we dealt, dealt with in this legislation, can I talk about again um, the terms of leases and this whole concept of the five year statutory term. It's interesting that whilst we've had the debate in this state that uh, retail tenants should have a minimum lease of five years. Um, and that has been the hallmark of retail legislation in Australia to date. The review in Queensland has recommended that there be no statutory minimum term because uh, their experience has been that the creation of these five-year terms has in fact stifled flexibility about the use of premises. And um, whilst one aspect of that is, is that we now have these provisions for six-month leases, it's actually resulted in leases being no more than five years because of the inflexibility caused by these five-year blocks that are given to tenants. So in Queensland, we think that uh, the legislation is going to change this so that there will be no statutory minimum anymore. Uh, we suspect that changes will be affected to the same effect in other states, particularly New South Wales, and I would suspect that over time, this five-year period will disappear and we'll be back to the position we were something like 20 years ago when it became um, a, a function of discussions between the landlord and the tenant as what was appropriate for both parties. And I actually think that that's probably a sensible thing. Unfortunately, it's going to take us a few years to get to that point. Can I move now to unconscionable misleading and deceptive conduct? As I mentioned in my opening remarks, the unconscionable conduct provisions which came into effect earlier um, have been amended so that it deals with uh, situations where the tenant suffers or is likely to suffer loss or damage. So there's almost an anticipatory uh, provision here that says that if I'm likely to suffer loss because of your unconscionable conduct, I've got a claim against you. Now that's a significant uh, change in theory. Whether we see that in, in practice remains to be seen. Um, this legislation brings into effect from 1 January this year misleading and deceptive conduct provisions. They effectively mirror the provisions of the Competition and Consumer Act. However, in the context of the retail legislation, this misleading and deceptive conduct has to be in connection with the lease. The, what, what's the position if the lease is not entered into? We actually don't have a lease in respect of which there can be misleading and deceptive conduct. So um, there can only be misleading and deceptive conduct in respect of a lease that's actually entered into between the landlord and the tenant. If there is misleading and deceptive conduct on either side, that results in the lease not having been entered into, then these provisions will not be able to be used by the parties. Having said that, there may be relief under the Competition and Consumer Act for misleading and deceptive conduct in a general sense. However, those proceedings have to be commenced in either the Federal Court or the Supreme Court, which is a much more expensive jurisdiction than the SAT. Um, 
So that's probably my, my cautionary tale on misleading and deceptive conduct. Um, before we move on to transitional matters, there's a question regarding can a tenant be charged for electricity consumption at a higher rate than that paid by the centre to the supplier? Um, we considered this recently and our view is that you can do that but you must have specific clause in your document that allows you to do that. Yeah, I think um, this, it, there has to be clear disclosure that, um, about the basis on which the costs are going to be charged. And if you, if, if the tenant, is, if the landlord is a bulk purchaser of electricity and then gets a discount and is able to pass that on at a profit to the tenants, it needs to be made clear the basis on which they're going to be charged. Um, you need to be very careful here because the ACCC has looked at this in the past, although it's not made any specific rulings on this. Their um, commentary is, however, that they think that um, if there is not adequate and clear disclosure to the tenants that this is this is happening, that, um, that the landlord will have engaged in misleading and deceptive conduct. So you need to be very careful about the disclosure in that regard. So if we just have a look at transitional matters, um, there have been some provisions in the Act dealing with transitional matters due to the fact that there are obviously already leases in place when these amendments came into effect. So some of the amendments do not apply to the existing retail shop leases and an existing retail shop lease is defined in Schedule 1, Clause 3 of the Act. That means a lease that was entered into before the commencement of the 2011 Amending Act, so before 1 January 2013. So if we look at the concept of entered into, that is if the tenants take in possession of the premises or have they have a fully executed lease document. So the changes that don't apply to existing retail leases are the changes to the form of the disclosure statement and the tenant's right to terminate for non-disclosure. That tenant still has a 60-day period, not the six-month period. Um, the changes regarding to the form of the tenant guide and the requirement to include details about the landlord's fixtures and fittings in the disclosure statement. The um, changes to section 13 of the Act, that's concerning the right to the five-year term to leases of less than six months. The clauses allowing for termination of a lease prior to expiry of the guaranteed five-year term and new clauses in relation to relocation do not apply and the requirement that refurbishing and refitting provisions contain adequate detail and this refers to a new section, um, section 14C of the Act which provides that a provision of a lease requiring a tenant to refurbish or refit a shop will be void unless it gives details of the required refurbishment um, and as much detail as necessary to indicate the extent and timing of the refit. The changes that apply to all leases, um, and that's regardless of whether they were entered into prior to the 1st of January 2013 or not. Uh, the requirements to provide information on a request to a value undertaking a market rent review. The obligation to notify tenants of the option expiry date. Prohibition on passing on the landlord's legal fees to the tenant. And the prohibition on misleading and deceptive conduct. This applies to all leases, but only to conduct that occurs after 1 January 2013. And we've just put together a bit of a, um, a checklist, but did you want to speak about the small business? Uh, yeah, the one, one development here is, is the interplay now with the Small Business Commissioner in, in this process of dealing with disputes under the retail shops legislation. Basically, um, the, the Small Business Commissioner has been brought in as a mechanism to try and um, arbitrate disputes between um, landlords and tenants in retail shops, shopping centre, uh, retail shop arrangements. And the, the dispute cannot proceed to the SAT or further unless the Small Business Commissioner has issued a certificate saying the parties have tried to um, arbitrate the matter. They've not been able to conclude their differences and that is now in order for the parties to proceed to the SAT to try and work out what the answer will be. Um, one of the consequences of this is, um, albeit unintended I think, is that the Small Business Commissioner is supposed to deal with small business. But because he now has jurisdiction in relation to disputes in relation to retail shops, people like Coles will have um, arguments concerning their retail centres dealt with at first instance by the Small Business Commission and it's going to be interesting to see um, what resources they bring to bear in these arbitration processes with the Small Business Commissioner. Having said that, I think it is, um, uh, I'm not sure that this adds anything to the system we already have because the SAT has a mechanism to try and arbitrate and, and conclude uh, disputes between parties in any event. 
having said that, um, we have what we've got and it's one of those steps you need to go through now if there's a dispute between a landlord and a tenant. And um, just finally, we've put together a bit of a checklist for landlords that you can use in relation to your leases from 1 January 2013. I think we've just about run out of time, so we won't run through that, but um, it is on these on these slides if you want to refer to it later. Um, that it includes things um, such as the checking that you do have the relocation provisions in, that your refurbishment and refitting provisions provide sufficient detail, and that you're using the updated tenant guide and disclosure statements. Um, just in concluding, Matt sent through a note in relation to section 112A of the Act. Because we've run out of time, Matt, I will come back to you directly on, on that. Oh, sorry, my director's now told me I can continue. <laughs> um, okay, Matt's put in a question about section 112A about um, a, a retail shop uh, in terms of the rent review. Um, I'm just having a look at that. Um, it talks about, um, the review here talks about a market review that's undertaken pursuant to a lease that's actually on foot. Um, and so it says, uh, it, taking into account that the retail and let on similar terms as are contained in the current retail shop lease and is not to take into account the goodwill, the stock and the structural improvement. Um, and his question is, in regards to permitted use and market rent reviews, that the retail shop was vacant and let on similar terms. Is the permitted use considered a similar term and therefore the market rent needs to be considered to premises of similar permitted uses? Um, I would have thought yes. Um, if it's let on similar terms, then the terms of the lease um, concern the permitted use. Um, so that, that's the first thing. And I think it runs from that in terms of um, shopping centre owners being able to maintain the tenancy mix they may require premises of, of, of to carry on certain types of business in certain precincts. So I think the permitted use under the lease concerned or that we're looking at would be taken into account. That's my view on that. So I hope that's an answer for you, Matt. I don't think we've got any more queries here at the moment. So um, you've probably had enough of our dulcet <laughs> tones for the last hour. So thank you very much, everybody, for uh, listening in to us today. I hope that we have been of some use to you and this information is of some use in your business. So thank you all very much. Thank you Peter and Katie. That brings us to the end of the webinar. We hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you again for joining us and we hope that you will join us again for our next webinar.